talk about real estate, uh, protection for real estate and LLCs and LPs and corporations without talking about the elephant in the room that's on everybody's mind, which is known as the Corporate Transparency Act, which comes into effect on January 1st, uh, 2024. So we want to take a few minutes uh, to talk about this because it pretty much impacts every single person um, that has an entity that owns real estate. And we're going to be talking about entities owning real estate today. So what? let's take a little bit what this is about. Um, this is a scenario where, uh, once again, I believe we have a tremendous overreaction on the part of the government. Uh, I'm not so sure in the long run whether or not this act will remain constitutional. But it is what it is. Oh. So, so, so what we have happening is for everyone that uh, has an existing, basically, LLC, corporation, or limited partnership. The government. Uh, this is not a target for large businesses. The government is targeting small businesses. The puns that we're going to be talking about today, Gino, are literally the target of this legislation. The government is highly concerned that LLCs, limited partnerships, and small businesses are being used for to finance terrorist activities, money laundering, or tax evasion. So in their wisdom, they decided to create a database of close to 35 million businesses to be registered with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Uh, so the government can compile what is allegedly at this time, not a public, but a private list of who owns that entity. They want to know who it is. So it's available for governmental use. Matter of fact, might even be available for foreign governmental use. But um, very, very interesting. So what happens here is that they, once it's determined that you are a business that needs to register under the Corporate Transparency Act, which is virtually every single real estate LLC uh, in America, um, then the next thing that has to happen, and here's the timing of happening. For new entities being formed after January 1st, 2024, it used to be up until a week ago, we had 30 days from the time that the entity became effective to register the owners of that entity with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And the registration was name, physical address, social security number, and a... Um, valid picture ID, passport, uh, driver's license that has a valid number. And then when you do register the, as an owner of that company, you will get a number from FinCEN, and that's your FinCEN registration number. So it now they have changed it under pressure that it's now 90 days from the time that the registration becomes effective with the state. And it's those entities that are created by the state, LLCs, limited partnerships, corporations. Anyone that owns more than 25% of an entity must register. So the entity itself, you know, ABC LLC, must now register with FinCEN its beneficial owners. So if Gino, you own 50% and I own 50%, we have to register our information as the beneficial owners of 50-50 of that LLC. It appears that once, Gino, you and I have all of our identifying information filed with FinCEN, they will give us a number. And then when they would say, it would just be Gino Barbero, number so-and-so, 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 and so-and-so. So you wouldn't have to put in your driver's license over and over and over again. However, if your driver's license changes, street address changes, uh, driver's license number changes, you have to re-register uh, all over again. If there is a change in ownership, so if you own 50% and I own 50%, now we own 
33 percent 33 percent and we sold at 33 percent we now have to say that we own 33 33 and we have to register a new owner at 33 percent so that uh, that that must be declared in addition whoever is in control of our llc must also register with finson so even if paul is the manager of our llc managing our our, our llc for us even though Paul may not own any of our LLC, he must register with FinCEN. And if I am the attorney that put together the entity, I must register as the forming person that put together oh. uh, the entity. So this right. goes on and on and on. And so what has to happen is first to determine whether or not you're an entity that needs to file. Once we determine that you're the entity that needs to file, then we have to look through the layers of ownership to see which people are considered beneficial owners. You could have um, a interest in your LLC Gino owned by a trust. So then the trust is the owner, then the trustee has to be declared in doing it. And if the trust has other participants that can vote or non-vote, they have to be registered as beneficial owners. And so you have to determine who the beneficial owners are, and then all of those beneficial owners, control persons, and people that participated in putting it together all need to be registered for that entity. Many of us have 9, 10, 11, 12 entities, so that's 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, registrations. So for new uh, businesses, uh, we have 90 days to do that. If we don't do that, it's a $500 fine for every day that we're over the 90 days, up to a maximum of 30 days, and up to two years of imprisonment as a felony for not doing it. A little bit overboard, to say the least. So, Harry, I got to ask you a couple of questions because this sure. this is you're opening up Pandora's box. This it's, reminds it's me of when when the Health Care Act came out and Obama put up the website and that website wasn't even ready. They're not ready for all of this of what's going on. And you said a couple of words that were really important to me. It may be unconstitutional. So, if I have an entity right now and and I got to file for the next year, yeah, let how me, long... let me get let me get let me get to the the, the ones that are in existence right okay. now. Okay. So for all, which is the 35 million. Okay. Yes. Not the new ones. Now, yes. These for all of us that have our entities for years and years and years, we have one year. We have the year by January 1st, 2025, we must have those beneficial owners registered. Remember, it's the company that's registering the beneficial yes. owners with FinCEN. We have a year to do that. Now, of course, that may be pushed back to two years. Uh, we don't know, but it because it's everything is still very vague, but it's it's very much in effect. So um, there's two parts to this. So the first part is the legal part, where um, as Paul and I know that we that most CPA firms, most firms do not will not want to touch these filings with a 25 foot pole because they consider it to be the unauthorized practice of law in mm -hmm. determining. The beneficial ownership and who the trustees are and how the beneficial if you are of a trust and you are entitled to receive income and principal under that trust you're now considered a beneficial owner and need to comply so you have a whole legal analysis for every single entity entities that can go back 20 years 30 years you can have entities that have trustees that we don't even know who the trustees are anymore that they they may have changed over the years all of that needs to be determined. And when that's determined, then you have the actual filing that has to take place with the government. So there are two parts, the legal determination. And once the determination is made, then another organization, more likely than not, will actually do the filing. And whoever does the filing uh, also needs to report that they did the filing as well. So it is a very, very intrusive um, uh, act. And... My my humble opinion, it's not going to do very much because the nefarious players, okay? So right now, what doesn't it apply to? So it doesn't apply to large companies. So start there. What is their definition of a large company? If you have 20 or more employees and gross $5 million of sales, you're exempt. 
you don't have to comply. If you're a bank, a credit union, a securities broker dealer, an exempt organization, a public accounting firm, um, there's a whole list of uh, of, of exempt uh, uh, independent investment advisors, state licensed insurance producers, things that are regulated industries where they know who you are and what you're doing are exempt from that. And large companies are exempt from that. Uh, but pretty much everybody else, almost universally, all of our real estate investors uh, that are using L L LPs, um, corporations, and limited liability companies that we're going to talk about today do need to defile. And what I was about to say is that it does at the moment, it does not apply to trust. So if a trust directly owns, an irrevocable trust directly owns a piece of real estate, it is exempt from the CTA Act. However, pending in Congress is the Equal Act for Disclosure for Trusts. So that is also coming along down down, down the pipeline, should it even be uh, constitutional. And there's a lot of reasons why this could be unconstitutional. It's vague. Um, the burden is very heavy upon the public. It's targeted to uh, small uh, businesses. There are strict fines and criminal activity for even the slightest of mistakes, which makes absolutely no sense. And at the end of the day, the, the nefarious players, that, that the terrorists and money launderers are just going to find a way around it anyway. So who's going to get the burden? The small businesses who can ill afford to spend more thousands of dollars complying with another uh, government act. So, And there is a court case uh, going moving through the federal system right now to have this act declared unconstitutional. But at this moment, it's still very much in effect and we have to get ready uh, for for its compliance. So what happens if it becomes unconstitutional, Harry? Because I have I have thirty over thirty entities right now. So that's, I'm just that's thinking third, to myself, that's thirty sets of compliance. That's correct. It's, it's annoying. So I'm thinking to myself, more than annoying, I, it's a nightmare. Yeah. It's I mean, do I wait till like July, August to say, hey, please, God, make it unconstitutional, or do I just say in January, let me do all my filings, spend the thousands of dollars that I need to spend to, and then if it becomes unconstitutional, hey, I chalk it up as a win. I'm confused as to, as to what my next steps are. I'm probably going to have to take bite the bullet and do it in January so I, I can get it all done. But I would say as far as going forward, January 1st, any new entity that I create, I will go to Harry and Paul, and I will let them set it up correctly on the front end going forward, not take any chances. That's correct. And in, so, 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 But let's talk about that. That's a very, very, very good question. And there is no answer. So, but let's try it our best. <laughs> we need to be in compliance by yes. January 1st, 2025 for every of your 33 entities. We need to be in compliance. It's not going to be overnight for us to get into compliance because it's not just a strict lack of filing. We have to determine who in every one of those entities needs to file. Now, uh, and then we also need to, some of the entities that many of us have, we are not the sole owners of. So mm -hmm. so, so you have more than one. Then if it's a minor, they don't have to, if they're less than 25% ownership interest, they don't have to be declared. But for us, you know, you'll, you will file with FinCEN and you'll get the Gino Barbero number. And then it'll say own 35%. Gino Barbero, number so and so, so and so and so, so meaning so it's only for you one time in putting all of your data into the database. And then once you issued your number, you could use your name and number rather than address every single time. However, if your address, anything changes, we need to update our filings with FinCEN, not every one of the entities that we did, but the Gino Barbero ones would have to be updated. So what would be a likely course of action? I would think uh, preparation for it uh, is good, but I wouldn't necessarily pull the trigger immediately in January. Um, I would look at it a little bit, say maybe by the end of the, we'll know more by the end of the first quarter. Um, for it to be declared un unconstitutional, it would be, have to be declared unconstitutional before the due date. 
Um, and that's yes. highly unlikely. So the declaration of unconstitutionality would have to be taken up by an emergency session of the United States Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, highly unlikely, though, or that c could occur before that period of time. So what I think is going to happen is many people are going to wait and see and watch and see whether or not we have to go through or you know, spend the money, go through all these hysterionics, do all the uh, calculations of the beneficial owners, figure which entities have to be filed and get them filed just to find out that the whole act was illegal in the first place. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't count on the um, lack of constitutionality. I would count more on compliance. But even in, for example, the 30 days for a new entity versus 90 days for the new entity just happened last week. So things are changing. And it's 90 days from the time that the state says you are authorized to do business. So you file for an LLC in Florida. It's the date that Florida puts that into existence, not the date you filed it, that we have 90 days from then to bring it through uh, under the Corporate Transparency Act. So, Harry, what I would say, another question to you is if you have any LLCs that you aren't going to be using going forward, now, now may be the time to dissolve them, correct? That's correct. If you don't, if you're not having any any LLCs that you're using, there is a um, an inactive um, exception from the CTA Act, but it's very, very narrow. Let me give you what it is. The entity had to be in existence before January first, twenty twenty. Okay, so it has to be old. Is not engaged in an active business. Um, it's not owned by a foreign person has not experienced any change of ownership in the last 12 months is not have any funds in it greater than a thousand dollars. That would make it, it's just really, really, really narrow. Mm -hmm. Very few people would fall on that. But if we have, um, an entity that is in existence on January 1st of 2024, that you dissolve on March 1st, 2024 since it was in existence on january 1st 2024 did we have an obligation to file that entity before the end of the year <laughs> and we, we don't know the answer to that question yet or are we in violation um so there is a there's a lot of um ambiguity is the word you're looking well, for well, that's another reason for unconstitutionality <laughs> ambiguity in the law it's not clear and concise it's very difficult to comply with but this is this is what we're all facing. And today we're going to be talking about the utilization of LLCs uh, to protect real property. And this just adds a new level of, um, uh, we'll call it uh, government, complexity? government complexity, surveillance yeah. and lack of privacy. Now, to be honest, the you know, when you apply for a loan, you know, if you're going to finance property or do anything with that, all of that information is gathered by the lending institution under Know Your Client and doing their due diligence. This is not hidden information that's there. And this this regime of who owns companies uh, has been in effect in Europe for quite a while now. Um, and, and it doesn't take away, allegedly, our privacy. We could still form an LLC in a jurisdiction that does not publish who the managers and members are, and it still will not publish the managers and the members. This is allegedly only available to the government for the enforcement of financial type of crimes. If we can trust that to remain that way. Harry, one last thing that I would like to ask you is that maybe I missed it, but this has been going on since 2021, correct? The law was passed correct. back then. So it's been three years or two years they've been stonewalling and now January comes. My only message to anyone listening to this is get on the call with Barth attorneys. Don't wait. Be proactive because this is something that you're going to say to yourself, I'll put it on the back burner. You're going to turn around. It's going to be May of next year. Harry and his crew are going to have a a bunch of this stuff going on and you don't want to wait because it seems as if you're going to have to do some digging. If you've got several entities yeah. and you have trusts and beneficiaries and people you haven't spoken to, you have to give them the time to do the work, but you need the time yourself to start digging and, you know, creating wealth and becoming 
wealthy in this country is having responsibility and long-termism and being responsible. We can all be pissed about this act. I'm pissed. Harry, as an attorney making money on this, looks like he's even more pissed than I am that's because it's, that's not the point. But it, it's, it comes down to we can be angry, but what are we going to do? Let that leave the anger aside and be proactive and take the steps that you need to take to protect yourself by not going to jail and by not paying these onerous fines. Yeah. And the other, and the other issue that, you know, it's, it's easily lost in, in translation is the words ownership and control or control. Mm. So control is very interesting. So if someone um, has their, LLC ownership in a voting trust, all right? That voting trust, if it can control the entity by removing, man if you can remove the manager of an LLC and replace the manager of an LLC. So if we create a trust for the benefit of Gino, all right, and it owns an LLC that Gino is the manager of, if that trust can remove and replace Gino, even though Gino has direct control, they consider that to be control. And now that entire trust and all of its trustees and power holders need to be declared on behalf of that one entity. It is just unbelievable. So it really requires uh, a, a, a significant legal analysis of every existing entity and not just new ones, everything we've ever owned and acquired that's still in existence. And 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 there there doesn't appear to be you know usually there in the in in legislation of this nature there are the words that are used reasonable compliance because we've tried to comply we missed it was just so complicated we missed even with tax authorities we tried to comply we missed it's not in this legislation this is just you've not complied by the deadline five hundred dollars a day that you don't comply up to thirty days. And up to two years in prison, and they, 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 it's just it is, and it's it's the whole thing is a division of the Treasury Department, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network is doing this, so it's it's quite draconian. But I, I agree with you, you know, it needs to be analyzed. This should be analyzed by a qualified attorney, mm -hmm. um, and then separately, once the analysis is complete, then the filings get done. The filings, and then when we get our numbers. We should be okay. And once we have an entity filed and done, as long as there's no changes in that entity, there's no further filing requirement other than changes. So if somebody dies, all right, that was a 25% owner and that 25% is in probate. When that hits the new owner, requires a new filing for that new owner. This, So you have death. What if, what if this incapacity that changes? So for example, if my wife, all right, I'm the manager of an LLC and my wife becomes the secondary manager in the event of my incapacity to manage my real estate. If I become incapacitated, now she becomes the control person. She has to now register on the Corporate Transparency Act. So it's quite intrusive. I have got another question. I lied to you. What happens if yeah. I own the LLC next year and I sell? Do I have to make any kind of any kind of requirements? Do I have to notify them, or what happens at that point? Well, you're no longer the owner of the. Well, it, it, it depends on what you sold to. So, if you sold the assets that are inside the entity, no, because there's no change in ownership. They're concerned who owned it. So before Gino, you owned. $2 million worth of real estate. Now you have $2 million worth of cash sitting inside that LLC. There's been no change in ownership. This is all about ownership. However, if you sold 50% or 70% or 80% of the LLC, then that LLC needs to report a change of ownership. If you no longer own that LLC, you sold the entire LLC, I mean, there's to be a filing that you no longer are an owner of that LLC. Wow. I think otherwise, people... otherwise, that LLC, because there's a new owner now. They bought the LLC. They're the new owner. You're off. They're on. So you have to file off. They have to file on. I just hope anybody listening to this is, if they're on the fence of whether they need to create an LLC or not for entity protection, this may push them against creating one. And I would say that would be the wrong thing to do. Sure. But I can absolutely see it. People saying, I don't want to deal with all this nonsense and registering and all these requirements. And I would say that's short-sighted. I know it's going to cost you more. I know it's going to be more work. It's going to be worth the more work in yeah, the long run. That which brings us to today. So one of the, the issues that you, you very, very aptly said 
is that there's going to be a certain amount of uh, pushback to forming, well, it's not just an LLC, it's a limited partnership, who the general partner is. It could be a corporation, it could be an S corporation, it could be a C corporation. It's less than 20 employees, less than $5 million, and it has an asset. It's subject to the CTA Act. So some people will uh, try to avoid forming an entity. If you don't have to go to the state and register an entity, then the CTA doesn't apply. So what a lot of people may start doing, uh, and could be effective, by the way, is forming irrevocable trusts. So you're going to have the property owned by an irrevocable trust rather than by the LLC. Kind of pick up the asset protection that we need. All right. Mm-hmm. Have a trustee run it, you know, have it own it. It rents it, you know, whatever it may be. Very similar to what could happen um, with an LLC. Um, not as much annual cost associated with it. And for the moment, those individual irrevocable trusts that are owning the property would not be subject to the CTA. But that may be short-sighted because it appears that that's the next step if this is considered to be constitutional. And then the other issue that that, that comes up um, with that is that, uh, you know, many times we speak about in protecting real property, not to have too many eggs in one basket, not mm-hmm. to have too many pieces of real estate in one entity. But now if we had five pieces of real estate and we wanted five entities, I have five sets of compliance. But Traditionally, those are common ownership. So it's kind of boilerplate. You, the, whatever you're filing for one, for LLC A, B, C, D, E, and F. And there, there is no fee for filing with FinCEN. The filing, there's no there's no fee involved. The fee is in professional costs and having it prepared for you. You could do it on your own too. People, you know, they could do it on their own and file with FinCEN. They don't need to have a filing entity to file and they don't need to have lawyers evaluate. It may be smarter and better, but the, 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 those are the things. So it, it will have a chilling effect on uh, people uh, not using entities as much as they should for asset protection purposes, which is a much bigger concern than the uh, the FinCEN uh, filing. For the non-attorney on this call, please don't do it yourself. It, it's it's not worth the headache and the heartache and the few dollars that you save. Let a professional do it right on the front end the first time setting up. And I'm speaking from experience. I think I've created probably over 40 entities in my lifetime. I have never created one entity on my by myself. I've never gone to legal Zoom. I've never done any of that. I don't know any of that stuff and I don't trust myself to do it. Hire and find a professional that will do it for you and do it right the first time. True. Which brings us to protecting real estate. All hmm. right. So what do I see in protecting real estate? So one of the things uh, that we see uh, as you and I, Gina, have talked about before, people uh, are investing in real, real single-family homes, duplexes, fourplexes, some 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 commercial properties, wherever else it may be, and they literally, literally, uh, take title to that in their own names, or uh, take title to that in their living revocable trusts. And there's a misnomer. Some people believe that if they've taken title in their living revocable trust, that there's some form of asset protection. Hmm. But let's analyze that. So just say it's a, a single family home that you rent that you bought for rental purposes. It's five hundred thousand bucks. It's got two hundred thousand dollar mortgage on it, three hundred thousand dollar mortgage, two hundred two hundred thousand dollars worth of equity, and you put it inside your living revocable trust, which we see all the time. So let's examine what that is. So first we have landlord tenant liability anything that happens at that property we sue the landlord and the landlord is you for example you know individually or your trust is the same as you individually the liability ends with your bankruptcy it's everything you own your bank account your salary everything that you own that's not an exempt asset is subject to the claims of that landlord tenant liability. Now, people try to uh, mitigate that and should with some appropriate form of insurance to buy some insurance for 
the calamities that happen under the landlord tenant. And, you know, insurance is a very critical and very important part of asset protection planning, and this should be done properly, but it's not the no-all end-all. There could be a judgment in excess of the amount of the insurance because you're not going to buy insurance for the full amount of your net worth traditionally. And then there are so many conditions and covenants and exclusions that we may not have any coverage at all. So it's very important to have good, solid coverage, but it's also very important to now take that piece of real estate. We're using one as an example. We'll talk about multiples in a moment. And if we put it into a properly constructed entity now, it could be a corporation, which makes no tax sense. It could be a limited partnership, which does make sense, but we have an un, a, a, an unlimitedly liable general partner or an LLC, which is traditionally used today uh, to hold that real property. So if we put that property into a properly constructed, properly designed limited liability company and treat it with respect, as it should have, the landlord-tenant liability is equal to the equity in the property. So if the equity in that property is $200,000 and there's a $2.5 million judgment, it's $200,000, not your entire net worth. To me, the cost of forming an LLC and maintaining an LLC, which does not have all the requirements of books and records and minutes and board of directors meetings and shareholder meetings, is just right there. It's universally uh, the right thing to do. Uh, there is no reason not to do that. Mm -hmm. um and that llc can even be a, in many cases a, a disregarded entity doesn't have to file tax returns it's just a great look at the name of it limits liability and it's really good but there's another side to it you know that people miss and that is we're just talking about a landlord tenant you know and you got uh you know rats or people fell down the stairs or fires or slips and falls that happen on the property there's a property related liability but the other side of it is the owner-related liability. So, uh, Gino, you know, you or Paul, if the same thing, <laughs> crash the car. God forbid, you know, you're on I-95, you, you crash the car, and uh, you, some people are seriously injured, or you have a bad dog that bites somebody, or God forbid a kid has an accident in your pool at your home, and the list goes on and on and on, or it's a work-related personal liability. Um we now look down at what do you have? Well, you have 30 pieces of real estate that are entitled in your name. And I have a liability against you. I just go in, place a lien on those properties, and then I can foreclose on those liens and sell those properties off in order to satisfy that judgment creditor. Well, that's not really good either. That doesn't give us very much negotiating room in trying to settle that claim. So now we're looking at a different type of insurance, umbrella, personal umbrella liability coverage that usually has exclusions for the dog bites. You know, we've got the big dog, you know, bum, 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 bum. it's strict liability. So what happens there is that we lose our property. Now, in a properly constructed LLC, in a proper jurisdiction, and not all jurisdictions are the same, under proper management with a properly um, constructed operating agreement, the remedy changes. So if I, do you know, if God forbid you have that personal liability, I look down at those uh, LLCs that you have, which are done properly, I will not be able to go in and take your properties away from you. Now think about that. All 30 properties are now safe. Now what I am able to do is and it'll be my exclusive remedy if we've done this properly is to place a lien known as a charging order over the distributions that come out of that llc but i will not as the creditor get any managerial control of that llc so i cannot force a distribution to be made so if we if the llc who's now the landlord is collecting the rent all right and we put that rent into a bank account in the LLC, use that to pay property taxes, mortgage payments. You know, uh, we could borrow from it. It could do maintenance and repairs. All of those things are all internal in the LLC. We are not making a distribution. But as we all know, when you have a rental income, and uh, even though maybe people don't know, if you don't distribute it, keep it within the LLC, what the owners do get is phantom income. 
So you can have have twenty thousand dollars of rent net rent coming off of that property that you keep in the LLC. We still have to pay tax on that twenty thousand dollars rent. Well, mm -hmm. if if a creditor is so smart as to take that lien, which is the only remedy that they have, it's highly probable under the current Internal Revenue Code that the creditor will have to pay the tax on the twenty thousand dollars that you don't distribute, which is um, really a deterrent for them to take that remedy. So, really, we got upside down and inside inside out and outside in protection. So it's a lot easier if I was defending you, Gino, to uh, say that this potential creditor can't go in and take those properties and I cannot force Gino to make distributions. And you may have to pay some, have some adverse tax consequences if you take that remedy. But we do have an insurance policy here for $2 million. And my client is willing to pay another 10%. We're sorry that this happened. Can't we just settle this matter through mediation and be done with it? That is asset protection. And that's what it's all about. And to be in the business of real property without that structure, to me, is a dose of insanity. You know, you really need to do that properly. And the last thing, all right, and then I'll we'll 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 we'll, we'll, ch we'll chat a little bit. Is there's a third benefit that a lot of people don't recognize, and the third benefit is is that well, it's it's, it's actually third and fourth benefit: ease of um, moving ownership interests. So instead of having to go to the deed and going to the uh, recorder's office and the assessor's office and going through the governmental thing to make a change, if you want to give your kids 25% of a piece of uh, real estate, you give them 25% the LLC. It's a private transaction. I change the operating agreement and it's done. Mm. So instead of going through all the ministerial things that you have to do on a deed, all right, it's private, it's quick, and it's easy. And the other thing is valuation. And this is very important. You know, the estate tax exemptions, which are very high now for a husband and wife, at $23 million. So it's going to be close to $27 million in January of amount that we could pass to the next generation without any tax. Uh, it's scheduled on December 31st, 2025. So when we wake up January 1st, 2026. Unless something happens, it's going to drop down to six million dollars a person, twelve million dollars husband and wife, and forty percent of everything above that. So for a lot of people, that that is a five million dollar tax increase on a transfer from parents to children. That's very very high. But when you evaluate a piece, if you have a piece of real estate that's worth fair market value, million dollars. So if I evaluate that piece of real estate, it's a million dollars. You know, the, the appraiser comes in, million dollars, fair market value. Surprisingly, if you take that million dollar piece of real estate and put it into a properly, again, constructed limited liability company or limited partnership, um, and you have the appropriate restrictive terms built into the partnership agreement or the operating agreement, the value of that real estate in the LLC is about 40% less then the value would be outside the LLC. So, because I get a discount for lack of marketability, I get a discount for lack of managerial control. I get these discounts, which are still in existence under the law. So a million dollar piece of real estate for gifting purposes and estate tax purposes, 600,000. That's a $400,000 decrease in a savings of $160,000 worth of taxes. So we get the inside, liability protection. So just the equities is underway. We get the outside coming in so we can't take our real estate away when properly constructed. Administrative ease, and we get discounts for estate and gift tax purposes. This, To me, it seems to be an overwhelming argument that our real estate portfolios should be held in properly constructed, proper jurisdiction LLCs. And when I talk about that, there, single member, multi member, you know, manager managed, member managed, South Dakota, Nevada, Delaware, you know, Wyoming, LLC, all have different characteristics. So, in the hands of a skilled craftsman, if you like, you had said earlier, if you're going to do it, do it right to get the maximum protection that you can from that entity. Like you said, a quick legal zoom is not going to do that. You'll have an LLC, but you won't have all the benefits that you should have.
Harry, can I ask you a couple questions real you, quick? Uh, go, go for it. Uh, we had Craig at one of our events, one of our Jake and Gino events. He did an amazing presentation. Unfortunately, a lot of his answers were "it depends" and "maybe," but because and, and I think that's true because every person's unique, every situation is unique, every state is different. But one thing he had mentioned was LLCs versus S corporations. Which one is better to hold real estate, and why? Oh, oh well, there's, there's, there's no that. That's a very, that's a good, great question, but it's also a very easy answer. It by far, it's the LLC, vastly superior to the S corporation. And let's explain why. Because why is a big, big, big difference. Now, remember, in an LLC, not to confuse the audience, an LLC can elect to be taxed as an S corporation. So it could be an LLC, legal mm -hmm. structure, that has made a, an election to be taxed the same as an S corporation. And that's kind of a, a half, the, the, the cup's half full. I'll explain that. So now let's take two pieces of real estate. And I took this piece of real estate and I put it into an LLC and I take this piece of real estate and contribute it to the S corporation. So let's first look internally. I have an internal liability at the, uh, at the real estate level, you know, the usual toxic mold, whatever the heck happened there, fire, whatever it may be, carbon monoxide detector failed. And I now sue the landlord here. The landlord is the corporation. Here, the landlord is the LLC. Not much difference at that point. So, however, this corporation, by law, has ministerial things to do. It has to have board of director meetings, has to have shareholder meetings, has to keep minutes. Every state says, it's not a good idea. It's, you should. You got to do it. And so um, we're looking to see whether or not it's it's more difficult to maintain that entity that is not a requirement in the LLC. Mm -hmm. The other important factor is is that a liability to Gino looking down. Remember, I said that you shouldn't be able to get inside that LLC and take the property away. That the only remedy should be a lien over distributions, but you get no managerial control. That is not the case in a corporation. In a corporation, you own shares. And I can take the shares as a remedy as the creditor. Now I own the real estate and I own the uh, the property. So it's a giant fail looking down. So there's mm -hmm. overwhelmingly should be an LLC. And then last but not least, as long as it's not the LLC is not taxed as an S corporation, if you put a piece, two pieces of real estate into an S corporation, and now what was once a million dollars of equity over the years has grown to $2 million worth of equity. And you'd like to split that into another one. So we have a million and a million and not have 2 million on box. Would you take money out of that or equity out of that box? That's a corporation. That's a taxable event oh. in the LLC that's properly constructed and taxed as a partnership or a disregarded entity. You can take it out and put it into another one, and it's not a taxable event. So overwhelmingly, traditionally, there are some exceptions. The LLC uh, vastly um, is superior to um, uh, a corporation. I, I, it, it's actually a mistake to have real estate held in a corporation. One other thing that I learned from Craig this weekend, or he made it known, and I wasn't even, never really thought about it. If you've got an LLC and you have a property in it, and let's say you have a lot of money in that LLC, he said to split it off and put it into a different entity. For instance, we have our property that we're repositioning right now. It's 132 units. We're buying washing machines, another asset. Let's say we spend 100,000, 150,000 on these washing machines. His recommendation would be possibly creating another LLC and moving it over because if something happens on that property, everything in that entity, your checking accounts, your savings accounts, all the assets within- All the washing machines. That's why you need a professional to help you set this stuff up because these right. are things that you may overlook. You may keep your operating account and keep it funded and have money staying in there. And if it's just that one solution to pull it out and put it somewhere else it may save you a ton of money. That's why it's worth having these conversations sure, with absolutely. qualified professionals. I mean, can you expand upon that a little bit? Because sure. I'm more of a layman's term, but this is a truly important point sure. as far as I'm as far as sure, I'm concerned. Sure. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um not so much the washing machine. Let's just use it basically with working capital. Yes. So you have a valuable piece of real estate um it's throwing off a good amount of uh, rental income. And a lot of people 
do not take that rental income. They have a bank account for the LLC and they put the money in the bank account. So we'll see uh, if something looks like this, you know, uh, a piece of real estate that now has a million dollars worth of equity in it. And in that LLC, there's a bank account, $400,000, all right, that's been accumulating over the years. And I will, I look at that and I'll, I'll, I'll ask the client, well, why do you have that $400,000 sitting in there? And I say, well, I just didn't have any anything else to do with it. So we let that it's sitting there. So what we've actually done is we've now have the value of that landlord is the value of the equity in the property plus $400,000 in the bank. Now, since the LLC more likely than not was a pass-through entity, Mm-hmm. And they've already paid tax on that four hundred thousand. So I got four hundred thousand dollars after tax money sitting in a hot zone, where I have tenants and all kinds of issues and problems, and been there. I put that four hundred thousand in jeopardy. So could we take that four hundred thousand dollars out of that LLC and place it into another entity that protects the cash? And the answer is yes. And should we? The answer is yes. So now let's call it. We have a Barbero Capital. And that now has taken all the excess working capital out of those operating LLCs that have real estate in it. And we put them in that that box, Barbero Capital. Now, there's nothing that's going to sue you internally because your money doesn't sue you. All right. So mm-hmm. we have it protected from coming down from the outside the same way that we would have done the real estate. And now you need to do washing machines. I need to buy $125,000 or $200,000 worth of washing machines. Okay, got it. So why don't we just borrow the money from Barbero Capital, all right, which instead of taking it internally, and the Barbero Capital lends to real estate LLC $200,000. Your real estate LLC then buys $200,000 worth of washing machines, title of which the promissory note is secured up to Barbero Capital and or even against rents. So what we've done is Barbero Capital has two hundred thousand less cash, but has a two hundred thousand dollar promissory note. Its net worth has not gone down. You got your washing machines because you had the liquidity necessary to buy it, but the washing machines will have liens on them owned by Barbero Capital. So if there's a liability, you don't lose the washing machines. It was really simple to do. That, that's actually excellent. See, Craig didn't mention that part, but I I like that part. That's making Paul smile up there too. You like that, Paul? Huh? <laughs> yeah. We all like <laughs> we all like washing machines. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I have laundry to get done. I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> that's it. That is excellent. I love that's, that. That's that's, that's uh, money laundering. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's excellent. Learn how to launder money on the Jake and Gino show, right? <laughs> With washing machines and working capital. Correct. That's excellent. Love that. Gino, did you want to give a little bit about your background in real estate and what you're doing? Uh, well, I mean, oh, I got into real, I, yeah, I got into real estate about 20 years ago, just as a regular mom and pop landlord buying duplexes, triplexes, making tons of mistakes. But one thing I always did was I, I had an excellent accountant in New York, and I always had entities properly structured and. And for me, when I met Jake back in 2009, we just started buying multifamily and we thought it was just easier. I mean, when I look at multifamily, I, I truly look at it as a business. It's it's one entity, it's 10 units, 20 units. They're all in one location and they're producing cash flow. And I, I look at every property that we own as its own little cash machine. And we really treat every single entity that we own as a business. That's why we call ourselves multifamily entrepreneurs. And I think that's the difference between being a single family investor versus multifamily. Although you should always look at whatever real estate niche you're in as a business and scalable, be able to protect it and look at it as, as an asset that produces cash flow going forward. Yeah. Well said, well said in the market for you, or is the market are you all over the country? We are within three hours of Knoxville, Tennessee. So Jake, Jake and I are both New Yorkers, as like as what Harry did, what you did. We decided to move. Jake moved back in 2011. He moved down to Knoxville, and I moved to Florida in 2017. But we just started investing in Knoxville back in 2011 when it wasn't Knoxville that it is today. Uh, it was just coming out of the recession. We loved it because of the job growth, the population growth. We love the area. We love the the landlord tenant laws are great. The affordability is great. And it's just, it's ironic that 
Now, Californians are moving to Tennessee. That has never happened Correct. in the history yeah. of my life. And it's happening now. And we're just seeing the population and the job growth. We, we love the market. We were fortunate that we've been in this market for the last 10 plus years. And, and our focus has been multifamily for the last 10 years. Yeah, it's a great story. Well, I, I want to tell everybody listening here that, uh, you know, get connected to us. So we have a complimentary assessment that we do asset protection, estate planning. We can get questions answered on the new law. You can get connected with Harry on that one-to-one. So wherever you're watching this uh, video, because we're going to replay it in here too. I'm going to put my e email in the chat so you can see that. And uh, let me get everybody here. But connect to us. We'll get you one-on-one. -on -one. Gino's information as we restream this too is going to be available. Gino, what would you have to say as a parting parting words? Wow. I, I would I, I, amen. <laughs> yeah. I would honestly, I would say real estate is probably the best business that you could possibly get into. And you can get into it as a side hustle, like Jake and I did, but don't treat it as a side hustle. Treat it as a business. And as we've been discussing on on the call today, start properly. And it's we've we've used a lot of attorneys. And I'm not saying this because you guys are on the call. But we've used you for estate planning. We've used you for entity protection, asset protection. And I would absolutely wholeheartedly recommend your company to do the work. I've actually reached out to a couple other companies about the Corporate Transparency Act. They looked at me dumbfounded. One of them actually says we're not handling it. So it's very, it's, it's, and I, what I liked about Paul, you reached out to me a couple months ago and said, hey, the CTA, you were the first person that actually reached out to me and said, I need to get this in front of your community. So when I see companies and, and groups that are actually proactive in going out there and, and giving the information and giving the education, I want to work with that group. So for me, final words, real estate's the best business. If a pizza guy and a drug rep can do it, that's Jake and Gino. <laughs> Anybody can do it. You got it. Great, great and words. I, and I have to run. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Harry. Gino, Thanks, Gino. always great. Love visiting with you. Look forward Love to our next, next encounter. Take care, guys. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Bye-bye.